Okay, so I want to do a real quick video going over the arithmetic gates leading up to the ALU. So we've already gone over everything with basic gates leading up to some more complex multiplexers. The goal for this chapter is going to be doing addition based arithmetic style gates. So let's go ahead and hop on over there and just take a look. So here, let's just take a look at adding some numbers together because that's going to set up the foundation for what we're doing. So, adding numbers starts from a very, very basic concept. We should all know that we add two inputs, get some in the carry, move that on to the next step. Next two inputs in the previous carry get added together, and then continue that. So we're going to start over here on the right side. So you notice that we have two values to start with, 0 and a 1. Add those together, we get 1. We don't have a carry. We still will assume that there is a carry bit here. It's just 0 in this case. Now we add all three of these together. Specifically what's happening is we add these two together, 1 plus 1 is 0, and we add this, the result of that. So 0 plus 0 is 0, with a carry of 1. 0 plus 0 is 0, add 1 to it, we get 1, with a carry of 0. 1 plus 0 is 1, here, here, it's 1, carry of 0. We end up with 1, 1, 0, 1. Not a big deal. Same thing is going to happen here, 1 plus 1 is 0, we have a carry of 1, 0 plus 0 is 0, add 1 to it. Just continue this process from right to left until eventually we end up with 0, 1, 1, 1, 0. Not a big deal. Now, the far right one has a special concept of called overflow that's happening here. So we just continue on, 1, 0 is 1, 1, 1 is 0, 1 plus 1 plus 1 is 1 with a carry of 1, and 1 plus 0 plus 1 is 1 zero with a carry of one. Now, when we get overflow, as in we get a carry beyond our actual scope, we just ignore it. Treat it like it doesn't exist. And you'll see how that gets reflected in just a little bit. But that keeps our bus width proper. So everything we'll be doing in our hack CPU, leading up to the ALU, and just the hack computer in general is all 16-bit. This is 4 bit, so we just have these four values of 0, 1, 0, 1. So the fifth bit here of 1 just gets dropped. Now, for the first gate here, it is called a half adder. It takes two inputs and outputs the sum and a carry. If we look at, say, the 1, 0, 1, 0, add with 0, 0, 1, 0, it would be this far right one. That is the only time half adders get used. It's at this very initial step where there is no carry bit. So that's why it said just use a kickstart and addition operation. So in this case, we have a zero and a zero. Let's just say zero here, zero here. There goes an and here into the SOR gate, here into both of these. Zero and with zero gives us zero. We don't have a carry. And then zero SOR with zero is zero. We don't have anything to sum, so just it's zero and zero. Now let's say maybe we do zero and one. So let's just change this to one. Change this to one. The carry still zero because we're ending with the zero, but the zor is now one. Very similarly, is if we were to do one zero, then one goes into the top part, zeros in the bottoms. Ending with zero gives us a carry of zero. Zoring gives us one, and the most unique one, one half adder with one. And with all ones, as our inputs, one and with one is one, so now we have a carry. And then one zor with one is zero, so that'd be one plus one, get the zero, we have a carry of one. Now this carry is going to be what gets transferred up at the top, so we don't have a carry here, so let's just change this to one. The one one is going to be zero, so sum right there. And then we have a carry bit of one up here and that handles that. Now we have one one one, and that needs to be transferred over to a full adder. The full adders are used as a continuous elements throughout the rest of the operation. So if we were doing two 16 bit values, we'd start with one half adder and continue 15 on until we're done. And if we do four bits, so it would just be three on until we're finished. But everything after the half adder will have carry bits associated with it. They'll all need full adders. 
in our previous example, we had 111. So, like I said, we let me just let me do 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1. Let's do this. So, a half hour of these do a 0 to carry of 1. So now specifically what happens, I'm going to shift this over a little bit so it can be easily seen. A and B are initial inputs. These. So we half add those together. We should get zero for our sum here. Okay. So after that, we can determine if we have a half adder. That is going to have half adder. Our carry is one. We have a zero input down here in the bottom part of the half adder. C is right here, it's going to have a one. So we have one plus zero, which is going to give us a sum of one, which if we look at one plus one plus one, that is true. Because what's happening here is we're half adding, that's not a real word, but we're half adding the carry with the result of our previous half hour. But gross. We do this, we have one zero, there is no carry, so we have one or zero carry of one. If we do one plus one plus one gives us a sum of one right here, and then a carry of one. And so we would just continue this process over and over and over again until we're done. And that gives us the adding bit sequences. For our case, it's going to be called an add 16 because we have 16 bit sequences to add together because everything is a 16 bit value. So, using half adders and full adders, we can very easily create this gate. So, we want to pass the least significant bit or our zeroth index, the HL language, into our half adder. That's this first line right here. We half add the zeroth index of A and B. We generate a zeroth index for the out, and we create our first carry. Now, over here, we pass the rest of the 15 bits and the previous carry bits into full adders until you've accounted for every bit. So this is going to start the process of using full adders from the first bit, so A1, B1, our previous carry that we generated up here. We're going to generate a output for the first index and generate our second carry, transfer that over to the next one. And we're going to continue that until we get to the 15th bit, which is the last bit. We have A15, B15, carry 15 from our previous step, set the 15th bit of the output, and then we generate this carry 16. The carry 16, let's do this. Just something very, very simple. One, zero, zero zero and this carry bit up here this overflow bit is the same thing as this carry 16 it doesn't go anywhere the carry 16 just exists we create it because it complies with the HDL language we don't do anything with it which is the same concept as dropping it that's pretty much it or at 16 moving on we have a special type of at 16 which is called increment 16 or ink 16 for short. And essentially this is just taking a 16 bit value and adding one to it. So pass the entire first input to an add in 16 for our use case. So we have add 16 here. We see that a equals n because that's one of our inputs up here. But notice it's the only input. We only have one input, one output. But clearly we need a second input for add 16. What we do is we create the second input from scratch. So, like this part says, then pass true in for the least significant bit of the next bit sequence and false for all other bits, which creates this pattern here, which is 15 zeros and a single one. Now you do that in the HTML language is the zeroth index of B is gonna be set to true. And then one through 15 will be set to false, which generates this uh, value of one, which is what we need because we have increment. If we do say n equals say 14, what we're doing is saying, hey, 14 plus 
this value here, which is 1. 14 plus 1 equals 15. So we're just incrementing it by 1. Now, it's not a very straightforward process on how to do this. I mean, I wouldn't say it's not straightforward, but the way the HTML hang language handles this is a little bit complex. Especially remember that you do specifically need true and false, not zeros and ones, because that will break the language. So just make sure that when you create this, this is the only line that you need. And you do specifically need true and false. So just keep that in mind. Now, this is the end of the more easy gates, the really short ones. The next part is the ALU. So what is this? We have a lot going on here. We take a look at it, we have two 16-bit value inputs, six 1-bit value inputs, one 16-bit value output, and then two 1-bit value outputs as well. And the goal of the ALU is to apply some function on two values. So we're going to compute some function here. Uh, let's say addition just because that would be straightforward on two 16-bit value well two two separate twos complement 16-bit values because we can deal with signed data here so they will be twos complement values so maybe we do five and maybe we do six for input one and two we should yield an 11 as a result and if we were to say do Traction here, that'd be the same thing as converting this to negative six, doing addition, and you get negative one overall. So there's a lot we can do with the LU, and you notice that we have just a simple F here, as opposed to six one bit value inputs. And the reason is because these are going to create all of these types of operations. So that would be 0, 1, negative 1, x, y, not x and y, negative x, negative y, x plus 1, y plus 1, x minus 1, y minus 1, x plus y, x minus y, y minus x, x bitwise and y, and then x bitwise or y. So there's a lot the, the combination of those six one bit inputs can do. And we'll take a look at those momentarily. So, this is kind of a graph that shows most of the operations or most of the different combinations that we can get. They're the important ones. So, what you might see is a specific way to say create one, negative one. There'd be multiple ways of creating it, but there would be way too many different uh, combinations to show in a graph. So we're just going to take a look at some of these more important ones, at least just on the slide. I'm not going to go over the actual process, how these work, just because I would be here for way too long. So I will say that we do have the ability to create three constant values. 0, 1, and negative 1. Those three constant values are very important, and that will be explained in chapter 4, but they are direct results of the ALU. So we can use those later on. Everything else is some operation based on one of these two variables. So, just keep that in mind for the future. Let me move from there. This is more of a detailed breakdown of what's happening with those six one bit values. So we have presetting the X input, we have ZX and NX, presetting the Y input of ZY and NY, selecting between computing addition and AND, or, well, or AND, which is our function operation, or F, and then post setting the output with n0, and then of course, our actual result. Now, zx and zy 
and nx and y are the same thing except for one applies to x and one applies to y. So if you have zx, you're choosing between the x input and zero. Same thing with zy, you have the y input for zero. Whereas nx is choosing between the x input and negated x or not x. And y is the y input or not y. And z or and o is the output or the not of the output. And then function is just either x plus y or x and y. So all these can be handled using these six one bit input, six one bit inputs. Sorry. But how do we do this in hardware? Because we can see that these are a bunch of if statements here. If zx and x equals zero if nx and x equals not x, so on and so forth. And the way we do that is a specific gate. That if you look at it the right way, it's basically an if else statement. And that's muxes. We can use the one bit values of zx, nx, zy, and so on and so forth as the select pins muxes to determine the actual results of them. So, there's going to be a lot of schematics, so bear with me. This is going to be the first part. Now, keep in mind, you see x slash y, zx slash zy. This is two steps, two separate steps. One is handled for the x input, one is handled for the y input, y input but they'd be mirrored. The logic will be the exact same. So, let's say... I have, I don't know, I'm going to do decimal values, 17, okay, if 17 or zero, and then maybe a slick pin is zero, this is saying if zx, then x equals zero, but I have a zero here which would be false, so that means that I want the actual zero, one for the mux, I want the actual x input, so I'll output 17. Whereas if I had one, then I'm saying, yes, I would, I want the actual zero and I would have an output of zero and that would go through the rest of the ALU. I'm going to keep 17 here and just kind of call it. Okay. And then we have the second part, which is choosing between the previous result of part one for other X or Y and NX and Y. So we're choosing, do we want the previous result or do we want the negated version or the not version of that? And so I have a not gate. So this will be 17, it be not 17. And let's say I do a one here. And that's saying, yes, I do want not 17. In this case, not X probably. Now this part is where our previous mirrors converge. As you see that we get the results of part 2x here and here, and the results of part 2y here and here. And that's because we were going to take our, let's say I did negate 17 for x, and then I actually did choose 0 for y. So now I'm choosing to and the not 17 and 0, which would be, um, well, that'd be 0. As a result and then add 16 well that'd be not 17 as a result because I'm not adding anything to it so this would be what I'm choosing between do I want 0 or do I want not 17 and it's going to be based on am I doing it am I doing a 16 bit and or am I doing a 16 bit app if I do 0 then that says I want the top one then my output is 0 too bad. There's one more step here where we get the results of our part three, which in our case was zero. So zero or not zero. And if I say zero, then my output for the overall ALU is just going to be a humble zero. Not too bad overall. But as you can see, Based on what my two inputs were, my X and my Y, and the series of my control bits, 
my results can change very quickly at very, very minor steps. So if I went back a step and said, hey, I don't want the ad, set, ad 16, uh, if I don't want the and 16, I want the ad 16 instead, then I would have ended up choosing not 17 or 17. And then basically I can say whichever these I want. Yes, I do want 17 here. Then I will the actual X input. So I just get X as a result. There's just, there's a lot of things that the ALU can do. And this is a very, very simple one as well. There's not a lot of complexity. We're just doing and, and add, and then a lot of variations of everything in between off of just some basic Boolean manipulation. So nothing overtly complicated is happening. However, even though we have the 16-bit output, we're not quite done because if you recall, there are two one-bit outputs as well. So what we've done so far is we have created the ALU that has no statistic to it. So we just passed in some values and I forget what we had, but let's just say I had, I think it was 17 here. And then I, I'm just gonna say zero. Well, let's just say I did five, 17 and five. And then I said, yeah, I want the actual input. So I did zero here. I'm pretty sure I negated it here. And this one I would have done as zero here and then chose not to negate it. I would have been it with 17, not 17, zero, not zero. Excuse me, have 17, zero, not 17, zero. I'm pretty sure I chose, yeah, I got, I got X as an output, so long as I did this, I did add 16. Oops. So I ended up getting, let me see, not 17 and 17, and I chose to negate it. So that gave me 17 as the overall output, which if you look at was just, I just got X as a result. I just got the 17, I did nothing to it. I just chose, hey, I want X, and then this series of events is how I got to it. And that's the overall functionality of the ALU. But there is a bit more that is going to be important for chapter four. Well, not really chapter four, but more so five and six going forward. So this is getting my 16 bit value result. It is actual computation. That is what this is. So I had 17 and a five, my operation was just getting X. I ended up with 17 as my result. Now, this 17 would be in the form of some 16 bit binary value. Okay. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna move away from doing the 16 bit values, the 17, the decimal values and all that. And instead, I just want to say that my output of the ALU is this 4-bit 1010. That's it, just some simple binary value because this is all I care about right now. Oh, actually, you know what? I'll, I'll make it a 16-bit value. Just so it's logically sound. So this, I don't know what this value would be off the top of my head, but just assume that this is the result of my ALU. I had two inputs. I went through all of the different muxes, all the different steps. This was what I got out of ALU no stepped. Okay. So there is a convergence point here, or well, a divergence point here, where we have the overall output. That would be this. We have NG as it looks like a single bit 
and then it diverges again here to 0 0.7 and 8.15. So if you were to write everything out for the HDL, you would end up with something like out equals out, out 15 equals ng, and then you, you could potentially on the same line do something like out 0 dot seven equals or one and out eight dot dot fifteen equals or two. I got a little cramped over there. My bad. But these two you can do you can separate these out if you wanted to. Whenever you start dealing with these two gates. But the main takeaway is this one right here. Because there's, there's no gate here. But remember, these values in G and ZR, which are the two remaining one bit outputs, are just one bit. And if we look at it, in G is just the 15th bit of our ALU's output, which would be this. Now, what is NG? Well, NG and ZR are both flags to determine if the output of the ALU is negative or zero. And if it's neither, then we can determine that the output would have to be positive. So what it means by no stat is it just gives us the value and we don't look at anything about it. We don't care if it's negative, if it's zero, if it's positive or anything. These will be used later on when we construct the overall computer. So looking at the actual polarity of our values will become important at a later date. Now, what we do here is just look at the most significant bit for our 16-bit value output. Because if you recall, we have two twos complement values going in, so we have one twos complement value coming out. So to determine if a value is negative, you just look at its MSB. And since we have a one in the most significant bit, that guarantees that the value is negative. So if we take a look of this value of one zero one zero 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 one one zero one zero one 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 zero one. We may not know what the value is right offhand, but we can determine without a shadow of doubt that the result is negative based on the most significant bit. So we know that ng equals one and zr must be zero because it's not zero. So therefore that flag would have to be set to false. The negative flag would be set to true. Now let's change this up a little bit to zero. So that's not negative. So it could be zero or it could be positive. And you might think, well, if it's one in the most different bit, it's negative. So if it's zero, it has to be positive. And that is very close to being true. However, if it's all zeros, oops, all zeros here, then the result will be zero. There's one singular value where a zero being in the most significant bit is not positive. And that matters a lot. So instead of trying to set a flag for it to be positive, we have the very, very simple look at the MSB to determine if it's negative or look at the single value, determine if that's what our result is. And if it's not negative and it's not zero, then it has to be positive. So that's why I have an NG and a ZR plot. So let's just take a look. 
Okay. I, at, at this point, I am... No, I'll keep doing 16. 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 2, 3, 4. So all zeros. Everything is a zero. Okay? So what we do is we use something that exists in discrete mathematics and propositional logic called an existential quantifier. And that is looking at a large spread of data. And if any single input in that spread of data is true, then our result must be true. And we can do that by ORing all of the individual bits of our output together. So that's why we have these two OR8 ways here. So we made these in chapter one. So we're going to split this in half. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So here's one half, here's another half. We're going to OR all of them together. It's going to be zero. That's going to be zero. Or these two together. That's zero. So if we negate the result of our existential statement, then we have a one. So Z our flag is set to one, which means that our output from the ALU must be zero. And if we look at it at 16 zeros, therefore, yes, the overall output of the ALU is zero. Now let's change just, just one of these. A one okay so 0 0.7 starting here that's going to be one 8.15 here is still zero but one or with zero is one negate that and my most significant bit here is zero so ng is zero result of my existential statement yielded a zero flag for zero. Therefore, we know it's not negative based off of this. It's not positive based off. Of it's not zero based off of this. Therefore, it must be a positive value. And this even translates, if all of these are zero, only this is this, I know it's negative. Can't be zero because the result of 8.15 is one. It means the zero flag is zero when negative flag is one. Therefore, it has to be negative, it cannot be zero, and therefore it cannot be positive. So there's a lot of logical nonsense happening here, and it's not super important to chapter two specifically. It is a preface to chapter five and six where we start putting the entire computer together and start dealing with a lot more of, of our assembler and the uh, super, like, eventual assembly language that we'll put together so just a lot of different moving parts here i do hope all of this on screen makes sense so wait that's it for chapter two we started making a half adder, we made a full adder, we strung a bunch of those together and made an add 16, then we created a single value for an increment 16 as an extension of add 16, but we needed the add 16 specifically for the ALU, because that is one of the two operations, we do and 16 or we do add 16, so we needed to do that before we do the ALU. But that is the highest level of combinational logic that we can do in our computer. Everything going forward is going to move to sequential logic, and we'll get on that in chapter three. So hopefully everything in this made sense. Hopefully doing the actual project and reading the schematics won't be too bad. And overall, I just hope you learned something. So I'll see you in the next video.